Well, the Warriors made a huge trade last week. They acquired Chris Paul. The man has an injury history. We're going to talk to a medical professional, the man who talks about the Warriors when it comes to injuries and so much more, Dr. Narav Pandia. And later in the show, Spencer McLaughlin comes on to talk about Brandon, Brandon Pajemski. You're going to love what he has to say about him. All that and more is next. This is Locked On Warriors. You are Locked On Warriors. Your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow Dr. Narav Pandia on, on Twitter, at Dr. Narav Pandia. You can, uh, uh, I, I'll spell that out for you. It's D-R, obviously, for the doctor, N-I-R-A-V-P-A-N. D-Y-A, Dr. Narav Pandey. Am I pronouncing your name right? I know I've had you on before, but... No, that was perfect. Absolutely okay, okay, right. good. Awesome. Doctor, how are you doing, sir? Great to see you. Um, before we talk about Chris Paul, what, what is your initial impressions of the Warriors offseason? You follow this team as much as you do practice medicine, it feels like. Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe <laughs> yeah. I'm being hyperbolic there. But your thoughts on the Warriors offseason so far? You know, I figured there was some sort of seismic change coming. You know, I think a lot of us expected Jordan Poole to get traded, you know, especially with what happened on you know, early on in the season with the punch that everyone talks about. Um, I just didn't expect it to be for Chris Paul. You know, I think that's the big, uh, you know, the big surprise, but obviously Chris Paul has a lot of experience, a lot of injuries as well too, but uh, yeah. <laughs> was not expecting Chris Paul to be in a Warriors uniform. That was not at the top of my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Chris Paul thing was huge. And that's a huge reason why I thought of you. Uh, I mean, besides the fact that you do regular uh, weekly hits, on the flagship station, the Golden State Warriors, 95.7 The Game. You also have your own podcast. And I saw you tweet your newest episode was about uh, Chris Paul, his injury history. Um, I guess first things first, like what is his injury history? Can you detail to uh, the, the viewers and listeners, what has Chris Paul been enduring in his in his career based on your research? Yeah, so I think you kind of break into two different buckets. There's the stuff that people get concerned about. It's the hamstring strain, the quad strain, the groin strain, all these soft tissue injuries that have a tendency to pop up in the playoffs that I think everyone's concerned about. You know, Chris Paul gets signed, and then everyone's concerned about, is he going to play in the playoffs? Is he going to have an injury? So I think there's that one grouping of all those kind of muscle injuries. Then there's the other grouping of stuff you just can't control. He's had thumb fractures, finger injuries, you know, shoulder contusions, things that just happen by nature of playing the game. And I think that's really been his injuries kind of over the past couple of years, these random freak traumatic things. It was back in the Rockets day, the Clippers days, when you started seeing a lot of those soft tissue injuries that seemed to have not occurred before. So yes, he's been injured a lot, but there's the ones you can't control and the ones you can't control. And I think the ones that have happened more recently are the ones you can't control, but the bad stuff that everyone's worried about actually happened a lot more in the past than we think. Absolutely. You know, the, the the comparison I'm seeing here, and, and please correct me, you're the expert here. I'm not when it comes to medicine, especially. Uh, you, you know, two years ago, the Warriors brought in Otto Porter Jr. on a veteran minimum deal. He was instrumental, in my opinion, in terms of the world championship. Uh, but he was also, um, he's had a history of, uh, I believe, a left foot injury really plaguing his career. And so Rick Celebrini had a very strict regimen when it comes to his minutes uh, you know, not playing back to backs, uh, and and that, and that that regimen included the postseason even, where we we did not see Otto Porter Jr. play over 25 minutes a night. Now, Chris Paul, even though he's 38, I think he averaged over 30 minutes a game last year, which is in, very impressive in my opinion. Um, well, I guess what I'm asking is, do you see the Warriors and Celebrini uh, following this OPJ pattern, where in this in this practice where you're going to limit his minutes? Uh, it's a strict regimen. Uh, it, it, how do you see them handling Chris Paul? Similar to that, different your thoughts? You know, I think Otto Porter is a great example. I mean, I think you look at his actually his career, Chris Paul's averaged about 34 minutes a game his entire career, which, you know, everyone always associates with an injury, but he plays a lot of minutes. And I think a lot of those minutes then kind of catch up with him in the postseason, particularly early in the career where he has to carry a huge load. So absolutely, I think when you have an older player who's dealt with various injuries, decreasing minutes down has a tremendous ability to decrease soft tissue injuries. It also can prevent traumatic injuries. And I think what people forget is that if your muscles are broken down, you got a quad issue here, a hamstring issue here, 
then you're more susceptible to fall and then have that ACL injury or have that meniscus injury because your muscles can't protect you. So I think decreasing his minutes down, maybe say 20, 25 minutes a night, not playing back to backs could absolutely have an impact on him being healthy and being able to contribute, which sounds like what everyone's talking about him being part of the second unit would be a good fit for him in terms of both injury and fit with the team. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and being a medical professional doesn't just, uh, apply to your physical well-being. It's also mental. I know that's not your, your technical area of expertise, but I am curious to ask you for your opinion on this regardless, which is that, and maybe it is, I don't know. You tell me, but, uh, you know, Chris Paul has never in his entire career come off the bench, which is remarkable. Uh, I mean, this goes back to his rookie rookie days and for the first time in his career, he's probably going to be coming off the bench. Um, again, you, you work in sports medicine, you work with athletes, uh, do you think that'll be a difficult adjustment for Chris Paul to suddenly come off the bench for the first time in his career? Do you think it'll be a difficult adjustment for him to reduce his minutes uh, for the first time in his career? And this is probably something that, that the Suns should have been doing, in my humble opinion, the minute reduction, at least. I mean, they were working him uh, even into, into his late 30s now. But what are your thoughts on him adapting and assimilating to this new role? If you have any thoughts, maybe you don't. Yeah. I don't know. No, no, absolutely. You know, I think the, the, the physical part may be a little bit difficult for him initially because I think, you know, NBA players, they start, they get their warm up, they get to kind of, they've got their rhythm down. It might be a little bit hard initially for Chris Paul to get, get in the rhythm of kind of coming in sporadically unless there's set minutes for him and getting his body warmed up and dealing with some of the off and ons. But that's something that I'm sure that the staff and uh, Rick Celebrini were able to adapt him to. I think the mental part may be hard, but the fact that you had Steph and Draymond at certain points come off the bench, when you got two other stars doing it, I think that mental part goes away very quickly. Um, so I think he's got a template uh, there to do it. And I think they'll work him in with the minutes. And I think mentally, as much when athletes are injured this much, there's always that fear of when's that next injury going to come? Um, I don't want to play injured. So if he has an opportunity where he doesn't feel like he needs to play big minutes and he's going to be healthier, the positive mental impact of that could be tremendous for him. Absolutely. Well, are you, in your opinion, doctor, are you worried about Chris Paul this year? I mean, I, I feel like Dub Nation, maybe rightfully so, it's justifiable to be concerned about Chris Paul's durability. Are you concerned? I am not concerned. As long as the team decreases his minutes, I am not worried. There's nothing in his injury history. You get worried about an ACL, you get worried about a meniscus, you get worried about, you know, some sort of cartilage injury to your knee that's going to have long-term implications. Yes, he's been injured a lot, but he hasn't had a chronic issue that's going to, you know, kind of become something that I'm worried about. So if they manage his minutes and don't overwork him, which it sounds like they know they're not going to, I'm not worried about him having some sort of big degenerative issue pop up, barring some sort of surprise. Well, that is some great news right there. Let's switch real quick uh, to another player on the Warriors, uh, Clay Thompson, um, who's he's in the news. I don't think for the right reasons this offseason. You know, people are talking about money. Uh, he's in the last year of his deal. I'm hearing his name in trade rumors. Um, and, you know, this last season, I, I, I feel like even though he led the league in, in the end in terms of three pointers made, even though he had his his best offensive month in his career in February, we also saw a decline. And, and and I feel like the decline, maybe there is no correlation, maybe there is, but the decline in March and April leading to the postseason, I noticed coincided with him starting to play back-to-backs. Uh, he wasn't playing back-to-backs most of the season. Um, do you think there is a correlation there in terms of his conditioning, uh, maybe not, maybe catching up to him with the back-to-backs? Do you think it's just aging? What are your thoughts on Clay Thompson in general? Do you think he's going to come back next year and, and turn things around? Your thoughts are? Yeah, I think, you know, I think people still have a tendency to forget like how devastating these two injuries are in ACL and Achilles. Like we just got used to seeing him out there and him doing well. We're like, oh, not a big deal. I mean, these are big career ending injuries, even in other professional sports as well, too. So the fact he's out there, I think people just need to recognize that that's a big deal. And then number two, after each of these in injuries individually, you see a drop off in performance. Like it's pretty remarkable that he even got to that level. Um, so he's definitely an outlier, but I think what we're really seeing is the lack of conditioning over the summer. I mean, I think Steve Kerr talked about it. I mean, this summer is really the time where you can build your base so you can handle April, May, and June. And obviously he had the mental, you know, emotional fear of it happening again, which is what you talked about. So clearly there was a hurdle there, but I think if he puts in the work this off season, then come April, May, and June, he'll have his legs and, and have the endurance to be able to push through. But unfortunately, he is getting older um, and, you know, there's that's the natural effect. And these injuries are going to continue to have an impact on him. So I think, once again, 
just like as we talk about Chris Paul, you may have to limit the amount of time that Clay Thompson plays mm -hmm. and expectations on defense. We know for sure the one thing that definitely drops down after these injuries is ability to play defense. So I think if is if he redefines his game and says, look, I'm going to shoot, you can't expect as much from me on the defensive end, um, and I'm going to play in spots where I can be effective, then he's going to be great. But I think if we see the same Clay trying to play like he did seven years ago, that's where we're going to have some trouble in terms of his body not being able to hold up. Did you see what I saw? Like, I'm not saying Clay Thompson was fat this year. I mean, yeah. he, 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 there's, I don't think he, I'm pretty sure his body fat percentage is, is fairly healthy, but he did look bigger than in years past. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you're the expert, not me. So please correct me any, anytime if I'm saying something that's not true. But typically, in my opinion, when you're, when you're trying to, uh, deal with your, your legs, your lower, lower torso in terms of recovering from injuries like he did, the last thing you want to do is have extra weight to put strain on your ligaments, your joints. Um, and, and I didn't see a leaner clean clay Thompson this year. Uh, you, you alluded to last off season. He didn't go through his traditional uh, conditioning regimen. Um, his routine was disrupted because of a, of a mental block where he just didn't have it in him to play a uh, pick a basketball like he normally does. And that's his typical routine. He said, he's going to do that this off season. Did you see the same thing I did though? That clay maybe could lose some weight this season. Do you think he looks fine? Um, am I crazy? What do you think? No. Yeah. I think, you know, in general, you know, if you look at NBA players, you know, the off season is really when they have the ability to build muscle strength, you know, maintain weight and things like that. Because when you get in the season, it's so hard, you play, you recover, you play, there's not time for training. So the fact that he didn't necessarily get that intense training over the season, um, absolutely. You know, like, I think you could definitely potentially see some issues in terms of how muscular he was, how explosive he was. So, you know, I think people have a tendency to downplay how much an off season has for an NBA player. But, you know, you hear Steve Kerr talk about it all the time. We finally got a practice day in and it's been like four weeks of the season without practice. You're like, oh, my God, yeah. like how come how can players not be training? So it really is that one time where you can work on those things and you see Curry, you see all the videos of him doing kind of crazy stuff. So absolutely. I think if he did see some physical deficits with Clay, a lot of it has to do to, you know, back to the offseason and the natural aging process as well, too. But I think that with the with the right offseason and with him understanding kind of some of the limitations he did feel, I think he did say that, like, you know, I'm playing back to backs for the first time. You know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit tired. Um, I think it's, we're going to see a difference in terms of his body type, his endurance and his explosiveness. And also that first half of the season, instead of it, him, it being his training camp, it's going to be real live game repetitions, which will help yeah. him come, come April and May. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm going to end, end uh, the segment and your appearance today, not with a medical question, sure. but uh, with the Warriors question, doctor, yes. if you were the GM of the Warriors, uh, is this the path you would take? Um, are you happy with the roster? Uh, do you think there, or would you uh, pull some more trades and moves? What would you do if you're the GM? Are you satisfied right now? More moves to be made? Your thoughts, sir? You know, I think that the key thing is we've seen with every Steve Kerr team, even when he played with the Bulls, rookies and young players never had an impact on anywhere he's been. <laughs> yeah. You know, so clearly, you know, seeing Jordan Poole get traded, see PBJ get traded, not surprising. It's going to be interesting to see what they do with Kaminga. I think he's the key piece right there. If Kamin can contribute, he gets time. Then I think their ability to go far within the playoffs would be really high. If Kaminga doesn't play, then you look at the roster and you're like, you've got a lot of older players, you know, people, you've got Looney and Wiggins, and then your bench is, you know, who knows where DiVincenzo is going. So, you know, I think really the key is if they keep Kaminga and develop him, then I'm happy. If their plan is to try to trade Kaminga, then I do get a little bit worried about where they're going to get that youth, that explosiveness, because you can't play 34, 35 year olds. 82 games in the playoffs and expect them to be ready. So I do worry a little bit about the depth. Absolutely, man. Right now, what I'm seeing is is a striking resemblance to the 2013 Lakers. You brought Steve Nash in when he was 38. Uh, and, and on that note, I'm totally with you. If you're going to keep this roster the way it is, Kaminga and Moody just need to play. I, I, you know, they, they need to have really significant roles. And um, or we might see another move coming. Uh, anything else you want to promote, mention? Uh, floor is yours, sir. Uh, take it away. No, absolutely no. If you have questions about injuries, uh, random Dub Nation fan stuff for me, <laughs> I am a fan too. Just follow me on Twitter at Dr. Nero Bundia. And uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Doctor, it's always a pleasure, sir. I know it's been a, a little while since we last had you on. I, I, it's never intentional. Uh, <laughs> I always incredibly value your expertise and just you in general. Thank you so much, doctor. It really was a pleasure and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so All much. Right, take care. And that was Dr. Nirav Pandia. Uh, real quick, want to give some love to a sponsor of the program, and that's Bird Dogs. Uh, right, is that our sponsor today? No, it's actually eBay Motors. I got the wrong overlay. I apologize. eBay Motors. It's all about world championship quality 
products. And for eBay, that's what they're all about. For championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. You are Locked On Warriors, your daily Golden State Warriors podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Warriors your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. Every day or tomorrow on the show, Brian Murphy of the KNBR Morning Show is going to join me. Been a while since I've had him on. He's funny, he's insightful, and he's incredibly knowledgeable about the Golden State Warriors. So he'll be joining me tomorrow. But right now, I have the play-by-play voice of the Southern... Utah is a Southern Utah University. Is that correct? That so, is indeed correct. The Thunderbirds. The Thunderbirds. And do you do play-by-play play for like all sports? Is it basketball? What do you yeah, do? Yeah, I there? do primarily all their TV play-by-play play for all their home broadcasts. So football, soccer, volleyball, men's and women's basketball, uh, gymnastics, and softball. Incredible. Well, Got there you go. And you covered. also host Locked On Ducks covering the Oregon Ducks. You correct. also host Locked On Pac-12. So you've got you've got the Pac-12 covered. You've got Oregon covered. You've got Southern Utah covered. That's a mass swath of Western United (laughs) States. But today, I want to talk to you about a player the Golden State Warriors recently drafted. His name is Brandon Pajemski. He comes out of Santa Clara. uh, And I haven't heard, not once, anywhere, anyone who has given actual expertise in terms of who he is as a player. I mean, we've, we've, we've heard Mike Dunleavy talk about him. Uh, we've we've read the scouting reports based off the the draft combine and, and and brief snippets, but we don't really know who he is. And 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 Spencer, we communicated briefly before you came on. You've watched him play considerably. I'm guessing more than almost anyone else. What is your first impression of Brandon Pajemski, the the new shooting guard slash small forward, whatever position he plays? For the Golden State Warriors. Well, people are probably wondering, Spencer, why have you watched Brandon Projemski play? Great it's because I am a Santa Clara alum. So if you wanted wanted my West Coast footprint to go even bigger, we got locked on Pac-12. I've been a Duck fan my whole life. I'm at <laughs> Southern Utah, and I went to Santa Clara. So we're we're really all up and down there. And WCC hoops are, are definitely my jam come March. Nice. I mean, all college hoops are my jam come nice. March. But, you know, uh, Pajemski is a guy who came in in a year in which Santa Clara was – Uh, not expected to do very much. I didn't expect them to do very much because the prior year they lost Jalen Williams, who was a lottery pick to the Oklahoma City Thunder. J-Dub, who's an awesome guy, by the way, in a great interview. He goes to the Thunder. He's really, really good. He was just so, so dominant at at Santa Clara. First team all WCC. And you lose a player like that. You lose Josip Brankic as well, who's playing professionally overseas. And you just think, ah, oh, yeah, no, we're not going to be able to do much this year. I didn't have high expectations for him. And then here comes this guy, Brandon Pajemski, and yeah. he's coming from Illinois. And you say, okay, I have seen, and I saw this at Southern Utah as well, with a guy who came from Illinois, went to Southern Utah, really, really successful, had a great three seasons there with the Thunderbirds. His name's Tevian Jones, just signed a two-way deal with the New Orleans Pelicans not long ago. And this is becoming an increasingly popular trend mm. in, in college basketball, which is guys get you know scholarship offers to go to a Power 5 school. They can't crack the rotation in a big way, but they still have crazy amount of talent, right? They, they, they didn't get that Power 5 offer by accident, but they just are getting, you know, outcompeted or out talented at some places because I think the amount of talent in college troops is just increasing, you know, so, so much and in college football as well. So Pajemski, a guy who didn't see the court like Tevian Jones at, at really at all or in a meaningful way at Illinois. But then he goes to a mid-major where he is the number one go-to guy and Pajemski's a big time scorer. And that is what stands out. I, I think the most about him is he will score at all three levels. He's a lefty. 
He is crafty. He can shoot. He's got the mid-range game. He's got the float game. He will do anything and everything that is asked of him as long as it is involving putting the ball through the basket. I think he's a solid passer as well, decent okay. defender. But where he's going to shine in his role in the NBA with the Golden State Warriors is, hey, we need points off the bench. And you look up and go, hey, look, Pajemski put up you know 12 points off the bench on four or seven shooting and you know knocked down a couple threes, maybe got to the free throw line a couple times. So uh, you know people are going to see lefty. I, I think kind of Luke Kennard, uh, when, when I see that, I see a lot of that in his game, frankly. And it, it's a guy who really, really propelled Santa Clara to have an excellent season this year didn't end the way they wanted it to in the WCC tournament, but he was their number one guy. They were still a really good team. They had some really, really nice wins this year, and Brandon Pajemski was the reason why. Uh, well, I mean, that, so far that's music to my ears, and anyone who's in Dub Nation, it's music to their ears. Uh, you know, one thing I'm curious to know from your perspective uh, is that Santa Clara is not a, a power school. Um, you mentioned that his first year, uh, Brandon Pajemski's first year, and we're joined, by the way, by Spencer McLaughlin. You can follow him on Twitter at smalls underscore 55. Uh, for the folks listening on the podcast, again, that's at Smalls underscore fifty five. Um, you know what? Like, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to ask here is, uh, he didn't play at a big school. He didn't cut it at Illinois. Um, are the stats, are the performances that you saw at Santa Clara? It, could that be overblown given the competition might not be as stiff as what he was facing at Illinois? Um, should we just completely ignore the whole Illinois uh, uh, year? And and does it matter that Santa Clara's competition might not be at that level? Your thoughts on, on that perspective? I, I wouldn't be overly concerned. I think you can think about it. I think you can ponder it and use it to perhaps temper expectations. You know, did we just draft the next Clay Thompson? Yeah, probably not. But then again, Clay went to Washington State. And they play in the Pac-12, which last time I checked is the host of Locked On Pac-12. Stink at basketball. So I don't know that that's like some big major step up there. Like being able to see the court at Santa Clara versus Washington State, it's not that big of a gap. Santa Clara actually beat Washington State uh, my my senior year. And I was calling that game on, on student radio at the time. But I, I, I think when you look at the body of work that he puts together and how mid-major players are consistently translating to the NBA, I don't think it has to be something of major concern. And one other thing too, Cyrus, and I see this a lot, you yep. know, covering college sports in in the way that I do is guys don't work out at a particular destination or guys decide to not wait it out and wait for their opportunity to play for a lot of different reasons. And most of the time, we even as, you know, media people or, or fans or whoever are never going to find out what those reasons entirely right, right, are right. top to bottom, right? <laughs> yeah. It could be an NIL consideration. It could be he uh, sparred with a teammate. It could be he sparred with a coach. I'm, I'm not saying that that happened. I'm just listing possible I'm reasons yeah. that I have heard before of why so-and-so left this school, even though it was a good situation. He might have had a relationship with a coach over here. One one instance that, uh, that happened very recently at Oregon, by the way, is uh, Khalil Ware, who's projected to be a top NBA draft prospect, but never panned out at Oregon in his first season. Why? The assistant that recruited him left to go take the head coaching job at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Interesting. And that and he's kind of a quiet, reserved kid. And so he never really clicked with Dana Altman. So that led to him, you know, being willing to put him in the doghouse if he wasn't playing well and he didn't develop and he's not super vocal. You saw the potential, but he never realized it because you know, uh, some have theorized, and I tend to agree, that that assistant left. So I don't know what happened with, with, with Pajemski at Illinois. I do know what happened at Santa Clara, and that's that he became a number one. He's a big time scorer. He's got that sort of game, and the Warriors drafted him in the first round of the NBA uh, draft this year for, for a reason. And if you're worried about, you know, oh, well, you know, I don't know if it can uh, work when you're playing against that level of talent, go look at what Jalen Williams did this year. Jalen Williams, who was a first-round pick from Santa Clara a year ago, first time ever the program has had back-to-back first-round NBA draft selections. Jalen Williams finished second in Rookie of the Year voting this Correct. season. I thought he should have won, but it went to Paolo Bancaro. So for anyone saying, like, oh, he went to Santa Clara, that's not... The guy who just came from Santa Clara was right up there neck and neck for Rookie of the Year with the guy from Duke. I believe Duke is a respected basketball brand. I what may heard, not yeah. be an expert, but that's what I've heard. From people who have talked to me on the situation, so I love it. I, 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 I love it. So, uh, 
And we're joined again by Spencer McLaughlin. Uh, he hosts two shows on the Locked On Podcast Network, Locked On uh, Pac-12 and Locked On Oregon, in addition to handling play-by-play duties uh, for Southern Utah, for the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. And he, we're talking about Brandon Pajemski here. Uh, one aspect of, of Pajemski's game uh, that I've heard virtually nothing about, and this is really what I'm, I'm curious about the most, uh, and I love your insights on this, is how is he as a defensive player? I mean, it, it, you know... We, we, I saw a report that uh, Mike Dunleavy Jr. had Pajemski number 11 on his board. Very high on him. I mean, so Dunleavy clearly loves him. Uh, you seem to – everything you're saying is getting me excited. Um, but I haven't heard anything in terms of his defense. Is that going to be a concern? Is that a liability? Uh, do you think that's part of his game that's strong now or could be strong? Your thoughts on Brandon, Brandon Pajemski's defense? Well, I don't think you can really go to the Warriors and not be willing to play defense from okay. from what I've seen. And as a Trailblazers fan, that's just not true in every culture. <laughs> so we haven't been able to put together a defense like my entire life. Not since we had like Martel Webster and Travis Outlaw. But anyway, <laughs> anyway that's a rabbit hole and a half. So I, I think the best way to describe Pajemski is he's a crafty defender and he's a willing defender. I never once turned on a Santa Clara game this year watched him play and thought, gosh, he's so lazy on defense. Gosh, he's not, you know, working hard. I don't think he's at the level of Jalen Williams, who I, he, he is one of the best individual college basketball defenders I've ever called a game for in person because, or just seen in, in person, frankly. He's the only guy who you may remember in the West Coast Conference, a guy by the name of Jordan Ford. I think he's bouncing around the NBA G League right now from St. Mary's. And, and Ford was just a crazy, crazy good scorer. And the only time I ever saw Jordan Ford pass the ball or not want to start the offense was when Jalen Williams was guarding him. So I bring all that up to say, Pajemski does not strike that level of fear as a defender right. into, other, in, into other teams' players. But is he engaged in that end? Yes. Does he have good athleticism? Yes. He's got great hands as well. If you find clips of him creating steals or just creating havoc generally at the defensive end of the court, he's got really, really good hand-eye coordination. is great for, for that sort of stuff. So I, I wouldn't necessarily describe him as an elite defender, but I don't foresee him coming in and, and just being this big, you know, defensive liability any more okay. than a typical rookie would be who, you know, maybe doesn't understand the entire system uh, quite yet or has to kind of get up to the NBA speed. Yeah, you know, my uh, uh, a regular guest of this program, uh, I'm honored to call him a friend, Hall of Famer Rick Barry. He and, and we host a, a show together as well. He always emphasizes. Now I feel like NBA. a schmuck. You have Rick Barry on here and me. Yeah, Rick, Rick, yeah, I, I'm lucky. I, I'm incredibly lucky. I don't know how else to put it, but it's 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 uh, and he's an awesome dude. And a side note, but Rick always emphasizes when it comes to NBA defense that a successful NBA defense starts with the team concept, not individual. And I read a scouting report with Brandon Pajemski, and going off what you said, I love the fact that what you're saying is he's a high energy, high effort guy because that's so much of defense in my humble opinion, and those traffic cone type defenders usually are just spacing out, not giving it their all on the defensive side of the ball. I heard someone call Brandon Pajemski a tryhard, uh, which I would love. I mean, I think that's, 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 that's his great, label on that's defense. A, that's, that's, that's a compliment in <laughs> basketball. Yes. It's, it's technically a compliment if you're talking about it in, in the school sense. It's just not directed that way. Right. <laughs> right. And I guess I'm like, curious, oh, you, you know, is that how you hard? See? You want to get into a good college? Psh, nerd. <laughs> the only time tryhards suck is when they're on the other team. Otherwise, I'm, <laughs> I'm totally with you. Uh, but yeah, then it's obviously annoying. But I guess, is that a fair, is that a fair uh, assessment of Brandon that maybe individually he has work to do, but the effort is there, the motor is there. And most importantly, he plays in the team concept of defense. Is that a fair uh, assessment? Yeah, I, I think so. And I, I think he's a guy who, you know, when you when you see him make a defensive effort, it's the sort of effort that will make you want to give him something at the offensive end. And I think that sort of dichotomy with the Warriors and, and the way they like to play. Now, I don't know how that works with Chris Paul involved because that's there, there are a lot of uh, a lot of different thoughts that bounce around in my head as to how that'll work but yes if you have him out there you know coming off the bench let's say clay needs a spell or clay's out with injury and pajemski is in there and you know dre wiggins and uh steph really want to run pajemski will do that and he also i think fits really well 
at the offensive end of the court because of the way that he catches and shoots, it's so easy. It's so flu- he's got one of the easiest shots I've seen. Like I, I love my guy J Dub in 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 Oklahoma City, and his offensive game is really well refined. But his shot is not as quick and easy as Pajemski's. And I, I think if you look at what you know J Dub did a season ago, averaging I think it was twelve thirteen points a game, being a plus defender. I, I think Pajemski you know, at, at the high end of his production level can give you even more than uh, what, what J-Dub even did a season ago because I think he's just got an ability to play a little bit more in the catch-and-shoot game, whereas J-Dub is much more cerebral. He honestly plays a lot like Chris Paul, you know, a good three-point shooter, but it's not necessarily what he's looking for. Pods will go out there and, like, if he'll, he'll, he'll throw up a heat check if he's feeling it. I mean, he can play off the ball. He can play on the ball. I think he just is a ready-made catch-and-shoot guy in, in the NBA, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see what, what he's able to do. Literally everything you said on this show today, Spencer, is music to my ears. <laughs> and uh, if what you say is true, the Warriors got a steal, in my humble opinion. Uh, Spencer, uh, anything you'd like to promote? And I'm curious to know, wh- wh- where do you call home? Because you got you're covering all these different regions. Where are you <laughs> yeah, actually based? Well, I, I, I live in, in Cedar City, Utah now. I am coming to you live from Central Oregon, though, because with uh, play-by-play you know, out of season, because that wraps up in, in the spring, I just have the podcasts, and uh, my family is building a house down here in Central Oregon where I'm coming to you live from. It's like basically done, but it's, uh, it's Central Oregon, for anyone who's been there, is beautiful, amazing, and awesome, and they have so much great golf. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> so we're we're in Central Oregon. I mean, that's a huge area. We're specifically uh, Black Butte area. Black Butte. Black Butte. Gotcha. Ranch. Yeah, I, so, I love it. I've, yeah, I've explored uh, Oregon. So I'm guessing you call Oregon home. I could be mistaken. Yeah, I mean, I grew I grew up in Oregon. You know, in Lake Oswego, just south of Portland. So that's where like home home is. Um, I reside now in in Utah to to do play by play for for SUU, but home home will always be Oregon. That that'll always be the place that I'll say, you know, that's 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 going home. Uh, and there's there's nothing like it. And with that beautiful voice of yours, I immediately understand why you do play by play. Spencer, you, again you can follow Spencer McLaughlin on Twitter at smalls underscore fifty five. Anything else you'd like to promote before we call it a wrap? No, I think we covered just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Spencer, thanks you so much for joining us today. Thank you so You're much for, for the awesome insight into Brandon Pajemski. You certainly got me excited. I, I that's hey, everything I'm, you I'm, said. I'm, exci- I'm excited too. I love him. I love him going to the dubs because he's not going to be asked to do a ton so he can learn, he can grow a right. little bit. But also, you know, the dubs needed some bench pieces last year, and I think he can definitely be that kind of guy. Incredible. Great stuff. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, man. Thank you, everyone. Take care.